Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Alex, um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I met Alex for the first time a few months ago, and Alex says to me, hey, I would love for you to come and speak. And I said, really? You want me to speak? He goes, yeah, you know, I need to make this an exciting event. I said, Rectech, exciting. I said, did you, did you mean to say that? But, you know, that's, that's what brings me here. That's what makes me excited. And, um, you know, let me, let, me, let me just start with, it's, it's, it's very personal for me. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to talk about myself, but one thing I want to share with you, I had a boss when I had hair in my head a long time ago, and he used to say to me, why are you admiring the problem? We need to solve the problem. Fair point. And I would say to him, but unless you know what problem you're solving, how do you know what the answer is? So if RegTech is the answer, well, what is the problem? The problem is Reg. Right? The problem is right in the answer. Now, I would say to you, hold on, that is not a problem. If you're a financial institution, that is your biggest asset. And you will laugh at me. And I'm going to convince you that Reg is the reason you are here, the reason we are here, the reason RegTech is here, and the reason that keeps your competition and your disruptors, if you're a bank or a financial institution, that is the reason you exist. Regulation is as strategic as it gets for your very existence in the ecosystem. So what you might be thinking is a problem that I might be trying to make you admire is actually your biggest asset. Now, the problem is, if we don't understand the nuances of what we can do with it, then we are not making use of the opportunity that we have in front of us. So before, before we talk about the solutions, let's try to admire the problem for a little bit, if that's OK, Alex. Yeah? Let's admire the problem for a bit. We have a problem. 500% increase in regulatory rule changes since 2008. 500%. Now, these are rule changes. Now, I don't want to get into that the rules have gotten better or worse. Any change is a change. And when you have a rule change, you have to deal with it. The Trump administration promises to change rules and make it simpler. Well, but even making things simpler is a change. And any change means you, as a financial institution, have to deal with it. So we have a problem. We have been doing a lot of analysis, mapping, talking, aggregating. You know, we, we think it's going to be about 120,000 pages of regulations for a typical global bank to deal with by 2020. Do the math. 120,000 pages. Okay. How many employees does a typical bank have? How many of them are in the business of reading, re of, of reading regulations? On an average, how many pages do you have to read? I mean, do we even read a book in, in a whole year you know, that is that fat? I don't know how big a 200 page, 20 page. That is, that is the problem we are dealing with here, right? We have a tremendous amount of work to do. I want to make it more specific. I don't want to stay in the aggregate. Look at at a, very, at a very granular level, a typical AML analyst, right, anti-money laundering, a typical AML analyst spends only 10% of time on actually analyzing what is it that he or she is supposed to do with the data. Most of the time is spent on data collection, on data, ag on data ag aggregation, and organization. Only 10% of time is spent on analysis. Ask yourself, is this the right is this the right way to spend the valuable time of our most precious resource, which is the people in the company? Guess what? 10% is also a magic number. That is roughly the percentage of operating costs spent by banks on compliance. Okay. Big number. Big number, big problem. That's where tech comes in. So now that we are done admiring the problem, let's talk about how we're going to solve the problem. And guess what? There's good news. We have been doing this for a while, right? Ever since 2020, you know, we said, look, there's something happening here. There's this thing called FinTech, RegTech, InsureTech. RegTech especially, right, we have been mapping out uh, what RegTech means, what the components of that are, and how technologies are enabling financial institutions to really solve this at a very precise level. So we have mapped out the market scape already. And so we are beginning to see the results of that. And Alex said, make it exciting, make sure it's worth people's time. I said, how many reasons do you need? He goes, give me at least one. I said, how about three? He is sold. First reason, RegTech is measurable and strategic ROI. You know, 634% typical ROI on a half million dollar investment in, in RegTech, you are getting over a three year period. Is that a big enough number? I mean, did I impress you with a big number? That's what they teach you, right? When you're doing like a talk kind of thing, put a big number on the screen and 
All right, I think, I, I think mission accomplished. I can, I, I can go now. You know, um, wrong button. Uh, uh, banks, we have, we have again done the math, right? We talked to a lot of financial institutions around the world. Annually, banks are able to save $500 million annually. Okay, and we're talking about the large banks here. Obviously, depending on the size, the, the numbers can be different. But a small investment in RegTech goes a long way. It is clear ROI. You can measure the ROI. And that is, that is worth admiring the problem for a little bit. So I don't, I don't think I wasted your time. Now, again, let's get back to one specific use case. I don't want to stay in the aggregate. AML, right? You know, false positives is a big problem in the AML world. Because when you have a false positive, you have a double whammy. One, you made a mistake, and you made the customer unhappy. And now you have to go and solve that problem to make him happy again. Ah. Rectech solution, over two years, 40% reduction in, in, um, uh, in false positives in AML. We have done the math. 40% reduction in false positives across the banking, banking industry amounts to like $3.77 billion. This is real money. Okay? Using technology to solve specific problems in Rectech that we've already mapped out Real savings, real money. Now think about, think about what you can do with the money you save, and that is my next topic. Let's just hone in on this for a little bit. And I know the counter is clicking, so I'm going to go fast. You know, compliance, again, big, big part of, of what regulators expect you to do. You know, um, and people talk about AI, machine learning, all of these new technologies. And technology can, can always sound scary. Okay? It can sound like, hold on, really? Am I going to now have to you know, reduce my workforce? Of course you do. Of course you do. I mean, didn't, haven't we always done that? But that doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong or evil. That is part of capitalism. That is part of us upskilling. That is part of efficiency. That is part of innovation. That is how economic growth happens. right? For anyone trying to push back on reducing staff because you know, technology is taking away your jobs, it's just nonsense. Call it what it is. Okay? You should be excited to reduce your workforce in the wrong areas where you're spending most of your time in data aggregation, invest that money in technology, free up those resources for better customer experience. That's what you want to do as a financial institution. It's a good thing. It's a good thing if you are required to reduce staff on things that should be better done by technology that will allow that, will allow that staff to do better and more meaningful things with their time. That is my next point. RecTech unlocks resources for true innovation not just for automation, but for intelligence that leads to innovation. Automation, yeah, that's yesterday's news. Today we need intelligence, and that leads to innovation. And so as we are now unlocking these resources, let us look at, again, some numbers. Okay, this is staring in our faces. Okay, over five years, um, I think in the period ending 2016-17, Bank of America paid $62 billion in fines. These are all public numbers. I'm not, I'm not sharing any trade secrets. These are all public numbers, right, from you know, wallstreetjournal.com or you know, gomedici.com, whichever. Um, public numbers, OK? The 2016, from, again, from the annual report, the innovation budget for Bank of America was $3 billion. Does this make sense to you? Does this make sense to anybody? JP Morgan, I'm not going to single out one bank. I'm going to be, you know, I, you know, I'm going to pick on all of them equally, OK? So. I can do that. JP Morgan paid, on an average, between 2012 and 2016, annually, $11.25 billion in fines. How many times would they have been able to buy Paytm with that kind of money? Who knows, or who, or who does not know who Paytm is? Right? If you are a big US bank, want to grow in Asia, want to buy the most, most uh, promising fintech startup in the world, you could have bought that five times over with the money that you paid in fines. City, I promised you, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on all, all of them. In December 2017 alone, City paid $70 million in fines just for AML compliance shortcomings. Again, you know, but they did some good things. They, they, they invested in feeds. I, I don't know exactly how much, or even if I knew, I couldn't tell you. This is what I'm talking about. The money you save in not paying fines and not, not hiring for the wrong reasons, you can put that into innovation investments. And again, in the spirit of big numbers, since the financial crisis of 2008, $850 billion have been spent by big banks in fines 
and for the shortcomings that they have had to deal with because they screwed up. My third point now leads to something that I feel is, is actually even more interesting and exciting, and, and I just want to take a step back here. Right? We're talking about rec tech, we're talking about you know, technology, we're talking about ROI. This is strategic. And this is strategic because it is not enough for you as a financial institution uh, to only save money and bring efficiencies. You are expected to wow and delight your customer, your customer who's increasingly Gen M, M not for millennial, M for mobile, M for high expectations, M for very discerning, M for wanting to be able to open a bank account in 30 seconds. Who can do that here? Which banker here in this country can say, you can open a bank account from your sofa in the living room in less than one minute? It's happening in Asia. Why are we sleeping? Customer has high expectations. It is the job of the financial institution executive to basically ensure that enough investment is going into these innovations, which, for reasons that are well understood, are not possible always to, to uh, come from within. Right? And the great news of the financial services, of the financial services industry, which, which I have, I'm beginning to learn over the last 10 years, I come from the telecom world, and one of the things that they did to themselves is that the telcos allowed the large tech companies from the West Coast to eat their lunch. The banks are smarter. How are you smarter? Because you are embracing external innovation. You are embracing fintech innovation and allowing yourself to wow your customer in a more efficient way. And so this is what you can unleash. And it's wonderful. We are in a wonderful time. Look how exciting this is. $14 billion invested in fintech in this year alone, as of May, maybe April. This year alone, we have more than $100 billion invested in fintech so far. We ourselves are tracking more than 11,000 companies on our platform in fintech innovation, you know, across 50 whatever segments. So now I think you see where I'm going here. Not only are you able uh, to save money with RecTech, not only are you able to deploy that money elsewhere, you are now able to make it easier for all of these fintech innovators who are working with you to be regulatory compliant right off the bat. Right? So if you thought that of the 50 fintech companies who knocked on your door last year, only five of them would make it because I put a wall of 600 things in a checklist for them to comply with. Ugh. Now you say, hold on, I have a beautiful rec tech infrastructure. It is beautifully automated. You log into the portal. It's all taken care of. Everybody's happy. How nice is that? Now, instead of five from the 50, you might be able to work with 25 of the 50 in a year. You are innovating faster. You have now unleashed the transformation which is what you, as a leader at a financial institution, are getting paid for. This is the third benefit of, of, of rec tech investment. And by the way, you know, this is not theory. We have 385 rec tech startups on our platform, nicely, beautifully mapped out, organized into all the various things that these rec tech solutions can do, not only for the financial institution, but also for the fintech who wants to work with the financial institution. Look what we have done. We have now created a beautiful virtuous cycle of innovation across the ecosystem, and everybody benefits. The startup benefits, rec tech, fintech, whatever it is, the financial institution benefits, and uh, investors who are investing in those rec tech, fintech startups, they benefit, and ultimately, and most importantly, the end consumer benefits because you are giving him or her a much better experience at the end of the day. So I think, I, I think, I, I think, I think if, I, if I were to give you one, I give you three, Alex. Hopefully, I earn my little 15 minutes here. Right, measurable and strategic ROI, rectic investment. It unlocks resources for front-end innovation, and you are able to harness and unleash a fintech-centric transformation, oh, of fintech-centric transformation uh, for uh, uh, for the ecosystem as a whole. I had to do this to tip my hat to to the late Mr. Jobs. So one thing I did not I did not mention, or you know, I made sure I wouldn't forget, or somebody made sure is that there is one more stakeholder in this, e in this e ecosystem. How many regulators in the room? Right? So some, some regulators don't want to call themselves that because it's not cool. Let me tell you, the coolest thing today in the ecosystem is the actions that regulators are taking that are forward-looking, that are technology-centric. We are looking at investments in sandboxes. We are looking at, 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 at regulators talk about uh, hackathons, you know, we are looking at regulators in India 
and in Asia, investing in infrastructure for real-time payments, the regulator is an increasingly dominant, progressive uh, force in this ecosystem that is only gravy here, right? We have a tremendous opportunity. RegTech is exciting. This is, this is where um, I feel investment has to go, and it's beginning to go. So I couldn't be happier to talk about this with you today. And if you might not have taken notes from what I said, nothing to worry. Uh, we have a report on this that we just published. And thank you again, Alex, and thank you, Chris. Thank you.